thing in presence. In fact, this is uh, the first watch we are organizing uh, after the virus started. And uh, in fact, uh, the idea was that uh, we stopped all the activity in presence uh, and uh, including seminars, of course. So we had, uh, we decided in our department uh, uh, to organize uh, a few workshops uh, to, to, to restart, uh, to, to use the, the thoughts that we have uh, for, to organize uh, at least uh, online, uh, online uh, workshops. And, uh, but uh, we didn't expect so much success. There are a lot of participants, around 140, so it's, uh, which is uh, one of the positive things, the positive side <laughs> of going uh, online. But uh, while we hope uh, very much to be uh, to, to meet in presence, uh, uh, at least uh, we take uh, the advantage now that we can easily meet uh, Visually, and uh, the chosen subject is entropy and QFT. Uh, the entropy is well known <laughs> subject, of course, and quantum field theory is also well known subject. But uh, only recently, uh, a lot of activity uh, started in the relation of the two, in the sense that uh, what we may call, let's say, quantum information for uh, quantum system with infinitely many degree of freedoms. I think there are a lot of perspective, a lot of things that uh, we can do. And uh, we experts uh, in, in quantum field theory, uh, especially from the algebraic viewpoint, I think we, we have the tool that others don't have to, to, to bridge, make the bridge to analyze the entropy of uh, quantum field theory. So this uh, was a very, very simple uh, workshop, just uh, intended to gather a few of us and to start uh, uh, to start a collaboration, uh, at least uh, from the point of view of uh, talks. So uh, I think uh, uh, the next talk is uh, in about uh, 10 minutes and uh, it will be in about uh, five minutes, but we, we may start uh, uh, even a couple of minutes earlier, if you want. All the talks are registered and it will be posted in the YouTube channel uh, of our university, at least the talks that the speakers agree. And uh, the first speaker is uh, Stefan Hollands uh, from uh, Leipzig University that we all know very well. And uh, the title of his talk is uh, State Recovery. So uh, I think that if, uh, if Stefan uh, is able to share the screen and prepare, we, we can use a couple of minutes to prepare the, the screen and then we may start as soon as you want. Inviting me and for organizing this uh, nice uh, get together with a well chosen theme from my viewpoint at least, and also thanks to Fabio Cioli, Vincenzo Morinelli, and Giuseppe Ruzzi for for co organizing it. My talk is about state recovery, uh, a, a, a program which is um, very well investigated in the quantum information theory literature and which is has very close connections to uh, ideas about entropy and uh, of late also has a close connection to, to some constructions in quantum field theory as I hope to be able to show you. Right, so let me get into uh, uh, some definitions um, just to set the scene. So um, we decide that um, according to the algebraic approach and the approach um, common in quantum information theory that observables associated with the system are members of an algebra of operators which is called A or B or C etc and it's it's those observables that are accessible to 
to uh, to 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 um, someone uh, with uh, access to um, with it being able to manipulate the system. So this talk, um, A, B, etc., I will always be for Neumann algebras, which are algebras of bounded operators that are um, closed under the star operation and under weak weak limits. States are positive normal normal linear functionals uh, on such an algebra. So they take an element and give a number, um, which is interpreted as the expectation value. And to uh, have a probability interpretation, it's agreed that the value on the identity operator is 1. Now, central to this talk is the idea of a quantum channel. A quantum channel is mathematically a linear map between two al operator algebras which maps a positive element to a positive element in and in fact is a requirement that is still positive if one adds if one um, um, takes tensor power of both algebras with a finite dimensional matrix algebra now physically channels um, are widely agreed to uh, to represent the most general quantum operation in physics. So uh, they, that could include um, uh, a quantum error correcting codes. It, a channel could represent transmission uh, through a noisy, uh, well, noisy transmission. It could represent the operation of restricting to a certain subsystem. Uh, it could uh, be could implement a projective measurement. Uh, it could uh, time evolution in open quantum systems or closed quantum systems, for that matter, are uh, uh, all um, examples of channels. And as I said, a channel is the most general, or is thought to be the most general operation that you can perform on a physical quantum system. Now, states are particular examples of channels where one algebra is just the algebra of complex numbers. I always think of channels as acting on observables. So this is kind of like the Heisenberg picture, where uh, in the example of a time evolution, which is a channel, you think of the observables as evolving with time. But as usual, by duality, you can also think of a channel as acting on a state, uh, whereby now just the action is given by um, concatenating the action of the state and of the channel, and that is the kind of more conventional viewpoint taken in the quantum information literature. But as usual, as the Schrodinger and Heisenberg pictures are completely equivalent, then so are these. Uh, is is then so you can, in this just the same way, you can think of channels acting on states or on observables. Now, states, uh, the channels typically cannot be inverted. I think there's some noise in the background. Okay, I think it's gone now. So the important point is that channels cannot typically be inverted. So the uh, unitary time evolution is not a good example of this phenomenon because you can, at least in principle, run it backwards. Um, but um, a projective measurement, for example, where you uh, project the state onto a, an eigenstate of of the of the measured observable. That is a typical example of a non-invertible channel. If you have noisy transmission, then the fact that it's noisy means you cannot completely recuperate uh, the information being transmitted, uh, quantum error correction, and so and so forth. So channels, or if you have an open quantum system, there is. Um, uh, transfer of information out, out from the system. So it, it, it is quite clear that channels typically cannot be inverted. So the question of this talk is, under what circumstances can a channel nearly be nearly inverted? So can you, after having transmitted a message through a noisy channel, can you nearly reconstruct the message? Or under what circumstances? And the focus here there will be channels of general um, sigma finite for Neumann algebras, which where the algebras are not necessarily of the type one, 
I say I say what the type one is, and the motivation is very clearly the application of this kind of uh, idea or the inequalities that we get to quantum field theory and also to a, cer a certain degree uh, holography. Okay, so let me introduce some tools um, known to the expert, but perhaps not known to the uh, non-expert in operator algebras. So uh, for Neumann algebra is said to be in standard form if it acts on a Hilbert space uh, and there is uh, some object called a, a, a natural cone and a modular conjugation. Uh, I'll, I'll explain in just a simple example what this is concretely. Uh, but then if if uh, you have two vectors, you can define... Maybe uh, I can see that, I can always see the same slide. Can, um, are you, are you oh. changing? I'm still on channels. Slide on channel, probably, I don't know if if it's a common problem also for other. Yes. Can you see my entire yes, screen? Common now? problem. Okay. Okay. Is a common problem? It's a common problem, yes. Okay, let me share again. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So can you see my slides now? Can my can you see my screen? No. 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 Mm -hmm. Okay. I think I need to maybe log on again. I yeah, yeah. don't think there's another way. Um, no way. Okay, can you hear me? E yes. Okay. Um, can you let me share my screen again? Uh, you probably are already. Um, uh, you cannot do this. No. So let me. Just okay. Sorry, just a sec. Okay, here. I okay. also have a lot of echo Nothing. in the line right now. Mm -hmm. So now you should be able to share, am I right? Okay. So you should see a slide called this talk yes. now? Yes. All right, I'll try to continue. Thank you. Uh, so you have to let me know if this, this uh, uh, gets stalled again. Okay, okay. okay. So my question was under what circumstances a channel can be nearly inverted? And um, my focus is on channels of general von Neumann algebras. Uh, I'm starting to introduce some 
basic tools. The basic tool uh, that we'll focus on is the so-called modular operator. It can be defined for general von Neumann algebra, and this was supposed to be on this slide, but because I'm losing time, I go straight to the example where the algebra is of type one. Can you see the slide type one? Yes, yes, we can. Okay. So this concerns the special case where the algebra is just the set of all bounded operators on a separable Hilbert space, H. The inner product is the Hilbert-Schmidt inner product, uh, with H being the Hilbert-Schmidt operators. The algebra acts by left multiplication, as in three. State functionals are density matrices, as in four. Uh, one has a natural purification of a state, which is just the square root of the density matrix. So the square root of a density matrix gives a vector, and the expectation in of value of this vector of an observable is the same as four. Um, let's ignore six and let's look right at seven, the modular operator. It takes a vector and then it multiplies with one density matrix to the one half from the left and another density matrix to the inverse one half from the right. This uh, operator is called the modular operator or relative modular operator and it can be defined also for general von Neumann algebras. Now there's a condition that a state is called cyclic and separating if the purification is an invertible Hilbert-Schmidt operator. Now the notation I'm going to use is that when A is of type 1, then a state is a density matrix, a density matrix has a square root or written as eta eta star. And then the expectation value is the Hilbert Schmidt inner product of eta with A eta, which is also the usual trace of A eta eta star. Now, the advantage of this relative modular operator is that you can define many things with it in the general setting that have uh, a very natural and simple expression in the setting of type one. So an example is the so-called relative entropy. Uh, the relative entropy is a measure of the distinguishability of two density matrices in the type one setting, and it's given by minus the von Neumann algebra and entropy of uh, the state, uh, plus uh, or plus this or minus this second expression. And in terms of modular operators, it's uh, nicely written is just this one uh, expression, uh, uh, which is defined generally. Um, it is a measure of the distinguishability. Uh, and in fact, it means the average information gained if we thought the state was either, but now we learn its size. So that's the operational meaning. And in general, eta, the second state, is thought of as a reference. So you should see next the slide, data processing inequality. Yes. Mm -hmm. OK, so now we connect the relative entropy with the notion of a channel introduced before. Uh, if you have a channel, you can apply it to a state omega psi and to a state omega eta to get a new state or new pair of states. And the key statement is that the distinguishability between these two states always goes down in the sense that one has this famous data processing inequality DPI. Uh, it's, it was proven by various people in various, at various levels of generality uh, the, the most general uh, uh, or final version is by Urman from the 70s. Um, it is 
a decide so it's a property this data processing inequality that is shared by uh, many uh, similar um, um, distinguishability measures um, it's absolutely key for entanglement quantification it implies many classical properties of the von Neumann entropy in the type 1 case such as convexity and uh, strong subadditivity and it's interesting to study the case where you have equality uh, without the state the, the the channel being the identity and this case was 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 studied by Pitts and others in the 80s um, we'll come back to this so proofs of this inequality there are different ones some use subharmonic anal analysis uh, which is a strategy originally used by Leap in his Leap and Muskai in, in a proof and which is uh, underlying much of Araki's theory um, and it's been also used by Epstein and others uh, in, in this kind of context. Another route is via variational principles uh, and this also goes back to Ullmann, Kozaki also and many other people. Okay, so now we come back to the question of this talk. Under what conditions can a channel between two observable algebras be approximately inverted? So what I mean by this is that there should ex exist another channel going the other way around called R for recovery, such that the original state and the state passed through the channel T and afterwards through the channel R are close for a class of state and that class could depend on the class of channels that you want to consider. Uh, so if this happens then the idea is that you shouldn't lose too much information by applying T or vice versa. You can only have this if you don't lose too much information by passing a state to the through the channel T. And so what not lose too much information means is that the difference uh, between the s of the states and the states passed through the channel uh, the thing that's non-negative according to the data processing inequality should be in fact small like epsilon so in fact if you have exactly zero so you have saturation of the data processing inequality then you would expect that you have perfect recoverability of the state in the sense that you, you while not being able to, to invert T, you can, you can recover the state in the sense that you have this equality. So the idea of a recovering channel is crucial to very many questions in quantum information theory. Um, and therefore, the, uh, the, the question as to how well a recovery channel can recover the state is of really fundamental importance for many areas in, or many many classes of questions in quantum information theory. So there is a particular recovery channel given uh, already in the 80s by PETS and it's for therefore called the PETS adjoint of the original channel. And uh, well, you can find its definition, for instance, in the text by Petz and or here, uh, 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 but it it's goes back to Petz papers in the 80s. And Roberto Longo has a nice description of this Petz adjoint in terms of bimodule, which however not I'm I'm using, but there is a connection to bimodules underlying many things I'm saying. Um, so it's defined as follows. So remember that a channel acts between algebras. So if you want to define an adjoint, you ha should have an, an, an inner product on the algebras. And the natural inner product to define is the K, what I call the KMS inner product. So uh, it, I think it's best, it's defined in terms of the modular operator, but maybe it's best to just look at the expression in the type one case where eta is the square root of a reference state. So in the uh, in the in the language of Hilbert Schmidt operators is the purification 
of the of the of the density matrix. It's the square root of the density matrix. So this gives an inner product on the algebra A, and um, if you have a state on A, you get via T a state on B, and then you also get uh, by the same formula uh, an, an inner product on B. And now if you have a state, a, a channel from B to A, you can define its adjoint, having now these two inner products, and that's called the patch adjoint. And uh, uh, maybe look a little unnatural to use the KMS product if you if you uh, don't know, uh, if you're not in the business. But for example, one nice thing that happens is that this adjoint of a channel is now also a channel. So it's completely positive. Now, what one uses uh, in the following theorems is not quite the PETS channel, which uh, it would be nice to have it, but um, one uses a slightly different channel calls the rotated PETS channel or PETS map. So um, in the algebra A or the Hilbert space uh, uh, of A and of B, you have the so-called modular flows, which uh, is, uh, is, is in some sense the Heisenberg time evolution defined by the logarithm of the density matrix for eta B in the time one setting, and it's uh, similar for A, but it's uh, defined uh, for general for Neumann algebras via the concept of modular operator. So this again is a channel, uh, but it involves additionally these uh, these uh, these time evolution, or you could that's why they're called rotated. It's not really a rotated; it's maybe time evolved. Pest channel would be a better expression. Okay, so what are some results? So uh, it is these go under the name of improved data processing inequalities. So, as I've mentioned, Pets et al. study the case of equality, so no information lost after applying the channel. Then he shows that the Pets adjoint is a perfect recovery channel. And um, a while, quite a while later, there was an important paper by Omar Farsi and Renner in fifteen. Who, who basically investigated the case not of equality but of approximate equality. Now I don't want to go into precise detail what the result was, but that was roughly their setting. Uh, this paper has um, triggered uh, uh, quite a few improvements, variations by different uh, subsets of people, uh, different. Uh, 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 permutations of people. I mentioned here a few in the references. Um, we will consider a particular improvement of this inequality that I'll uh, show in a theorem explicitly. But I should point out that almost all of these results uh, have been uh, restricted to type 1 for Neumann algebras and their proofs are also a very um, obviously restricted to this case, I would say, uh, and without a, a, either a very sophisticated approximation argument uh, or a, a kind of uh, an argument of a, a more intrinsic argument using intrinsic tools of von Neumann algebras, I don't think uh, a generalization of type 1 to arbitrary uh, von Neumann algebras was possible. Um, we did Obtain such a generalization uh, in a work in a recent work with uh, Tom Faulkner, uh, Brian Swingle, and Yi Su Wang, and um, also Faulkner and myself. Uh, Junge and Laracuente La obtained also uh, uh, generalizations, which I believe to be at least um, uh, uh, morally very similar, but uh, they use, a, uh, I would say, a quite different technical. Uh, a set of tools. Well, we're we're all using heavily uh, the concept of an LP space of operator algebra, but there are many versions of this which look quite different 
and um, it seems we use a, a rather different version than, than them. So now you should see main theorems. Uh, can you see the slide main theorems? Yes, yep, we can. Okay, and do you have no echo in my voice? No. Okay, good. I have a lot of echo feedback, but you know, that's okay. So what are the main theorems? Uh, now, the first one uh, was obtained in his paper, his joint paper with Faulkner, Wingle and Wang, and, and um, uh, the generalization of that result as presented here is in a separate paper by Faulkner and myself. <clears throat> now, uh, we have two von Neumann algebras, B and A, sigma finite, but otherwise general. Um, we consider the difference appearing in the data processing inequality, which we know to be non-negative. Uh, but the improvement is that we have an explicit lower bound, which uh, despite the parent minus sign is, is uh, also non-negative, and it involves the so-called fidelity. It involves the original channel. It involves the rotated recovery channel. And it involves a particular probability density given explicit by uh, this uh, expression pi over cos pi t plus one. Now, uh, you should read this inequality as follows. Suppose the information loss is small, let's say epsilon, then the left side is epsilon. So the right side is bounded by epsilon. And so you get a bound on the fidelity, so the log of the fidelity wants to be zero, so the fidelity wants to be about approximately one. So it means I recover the state uh, omega psi from its version passed through a channel, which is omega psi combined with T, uh, by recovery map with high fidelity. So this is what's written here, a small information loss in the data processing inequality in price proximity of the original state and the recovered state to high fidelity. Um, so there was a previous version of this result um, uh, applicable to type one for Neumann algebras uh, that appeared in 2018 uh, due to Junger, Renner, that are wild and winter, and um, our result can be seen as a generalization to general Neumann algebras. Uh, the fidelity explicitly in the type one setting, this particular expression involving square roots of density matrices. So it generalizes the amplitude, the transition amplitude uh, for pure states. You can think about it about this way. Uh, and uh, note that you can pull the integral inside the fidelity because the fidelity has, uh, or minus the fidelity, has uh, approximate appropriate convexity properties, and, and so you can use a version of Jensen inequality, so thereby obtaining a weaker inequality. Uh, here's a second theorem. It has a similar spirit but looks different. So again, we have. Um, the difference appearing in the data processing inequality, which we know by that inequality to be non-negative. But now we have an explicit uh, lower bound in now involving the so-called measured relative entropy. Uh, the measured relative entropy is the supremum of the restriction of the relative entropy to an arbitrary commutative subalgebra. And um, the terminology measured arises because usually think of this algebra as generated by the spectral projections of some observables. So you measure an observable and the statistics of the measurement outcome uh, are then used to determine the, the, the measured relative entropy as the classical relative entropy 
with uh, uh, def uh, defined according to the relative uh, uh, um, probability of occurrence of a measurement value, but mathematically it's, it's just with this. And R is 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 a channel which is the basically the rotated uh, recovery channel, but now you average this against this external probability distribution beta zero. Uh, uh, so this gives another channel. Um, so again, a small information loss in the data processing inequality. So if the left side is epsilon, now implies the proximity of the state and the recovered state, but now with respect to the measured relative entropy. And uh, this result ge generalizes another uh, paper from the quantum information theory community uh, cited here to general von Neumann algebras. Um, the integral here cannot be pulled out of the integral. Uh, and so it's not quite clear uh, which of the two inequalities is sharper, whether the one from theorem one or theorem two, it can be one or the other depending on the case. But in, in the case of, in the classical case, when the density matrices commute, uh, then it's uh, the second theorem gives the sharp result. So now you should see a slide called half-sided modular inclusions. Yes. Yes. Okay, so the rest of the talk is an application of these uh, theorems to a, 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 a situation in quantum field theory. I think rather than um, going through the formulas, uh, I give the picture. So you have two operator algebras associated with wedges in, in quantum field theory, and one wedge is sitting inside the other, like so. And then you have an operator algebra AA as, uh, 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 as shown above. The channel in question is the inclusion channel of AA into the big algebra defined by the entire wedge. And um, under this circumstance, you can show that uh, you automatically have a, a representation of translations uh, uh, of, the, of the light ray or the wedge by the Bx plus A group. And the translations in particular along the x plus axis, which uh, are labeled by the translation vector null vector A, uh, are generated by a, a positive non-negative linear operator T, or uh, usually the NEC operator. Okay, now you can work, this is an example of the setup with the channel being just the inclusion channel. And uh, you can compute the various objects and the end result is corollary uh, here, which gives uh, a lower bound on how much the relative entropy uh, um, decreases as you uh, uh, restrict, as you increase A. So by restricting uh, the, the algebra further and further, so making A bigger and bigger, the states become less and less distinguishable because you have uh, fewer and fewer observables. And this inequality quantifies by how much they become less distinguishable. Again, it involves the fidelity, but now also it involves the uh, exponential of the ANEC operator. Uh, so here is a conjecture. Uh, so one may in particular take A to zero, uh, and then the inequality would, there would be an inequality greater than or equal, but there's a conjecture by uh, us that you get an equality in this case. So it becomes sharp in this case. And uh, if this were the case, you would get a proof of the so-called QNEC because you can now apply this inequality to al replacing A by a, a, a shifted algebra and use the monotonicity of F. So you'd get the QNEC, which broadly speaking is, is this convexity property. 
Okay, so what are the tools? Maybe three minutes for my tools. Um, yeah, so I have until what, how many more minutes? Three minutes, is that right? Okay, I assume three minutes. I think you start that, uh, you should have 45 minutes. So you start that 10 until 55. So until five to three. Until 55? Yes. So 10 minutes. Okay, yes. that's fine. That's fine. Better. So some tools to prove these results. So again, what are the results? Uh, theorem two is gives a lower bound with the measured entropy. Um, theorem one with the fidelity. Okay, so you uh, so you may know for Hilbert-Schmidt operators the usual LP norms, which are defined by taking. Uh, a matrix zeta uh, forming its piece power and uh, then uh, taking a trace and uh, uh, taking the piece root. Uh, these are uh, very well known norms in analysis. Um, you can give a what is called a non-commutative generalization where you stick between zeta and zeta star a density matrix of some reference state raised to a certain power also in YVP. So these are the so-called non-commutative LP norms. Uh, the difference, the terminology non-commutative arising from the fact that in the usual case, you can write it as an ordinary LP norm just of the eigenvalues of zeta, uh, which you cannot do uh, in the second case if, if C doesn't commute with zeta. Right, uh, so this form is not very useful for a general von Neumann algebra because you don't have a trace, but you can give a variational definition uh, involving the modular operator uh, found along many uh, profound and technically hard theorems about these norms uh, in, in, in the paper by Araki and Masuda. So I'm not going to show why this variational definition is equivalent, but it's, it's for matrices, it's a very simple calculation with Lagrange multipliers. Uh, so some special cases, P equal to two is just the operator, uh, is just the, um, the Hilbert space norm. So recall that in the type one case, the Hilbert space was itself the space of Hilbert's mid operators. So it's it's the, the Hilbert space norm and on the space where the von Neumann algebra acts. The one norm is the fidelity. So you start seeing perhaps a connection with the theorem. The infinity norm is related to the operator norm as such, and the 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 limit as b goes to two is related to the relative entropy. So the idea pretty much is that the p norms interpolate between the fidelity, the relative entropy, and the ordinary Hilbert space norm. But that's certainly not all there is to it. Uh, a very important uh, lemma is is a kind of interpolation result. So such results are quite important and wide, widely known in analysis, also in, in commutative LP spaces, where they're classical results. Uh, so if you have some H-valued holomorphic function in a strip, uh, then you can in, uh, 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 estimate the LP theta norm, where P theta somehow is inside the strip, uh, by the well, by the P norms corresponding to the boundary of the strip. And in this interpolation theorem, uh, these probability distributions alpha and beta appear, and the the theorem is proven um, in the classical case. Uh, using a, a, a lemma called the Hirschman 
uh, interpolation theorem or the Hirschman, uh, which is basically a, a version of the Poisson kernel. Um, and uh, in the non-commutative case, especially non-commuted in von Neumann algebra case, uh, one has to use really profound results uh, by Araki and Masuda. Okay, so how to relate this to our theorem? Uh, so the key trick is to define a suitable analytic vector. And the analytic vector is, is, is defined first of all, uh, you have to bring in the channel. The channel has not entered yet. So you have a state psi, uh, then this induces a state psi on A and B via the channel. And then if psi is cyclic and separating, you can define this operator V. So it operates between the, the Hilbert spaces K and H, where the operator algebras B and A live. Uh, and then uh, the properties of T show that this V is a contraction. And that in turn defines use uh, can be used to to verify that this vec this vector G is analytic uh, suitable. And to this vector, one applies the interpolation theorem. I assume you can see the slide tools interpolation. No commutative interpolation. Yes, thank you. The tools okay. interpolation, yes. Okay, so you apply this theorem and then somehow the entropy difference pops up, the pets recovery map pops up, the rotated pets recovery map pops up, and the fidelity pops up, and this probability distribution beta zero pops up. So this works very nicely. Okay, uh, still not good enough because one wants to take a certain limit of the norms as p goes to 2. And it turns out that for general von Neumann algebras, this limit is extremely subtle. And uh, the resolution that we found was to define certain uh, regularized vectors first with using functions with uh, certain analyticity properties. And then, um, so the key problem is, Usually, if you approximate a state, then this doesn't mean that the entropy is approximated because the entropy is not a continuous functional of the states. And this, uh, if you don't uh, use an approximation tailored to the problem, you have no chance to give proofs. And so this is a kind of uh, approximation tailored to the problem, which we found after a while, and it gives a very nice kind of uh, uh, upper semi-continuity of the relative entropy with a correcting piece involving terms that can be uh, made quite small using a sharp hausdorff young inequality. Uh, further inequalities needed uh, are uh, uh, the araki leap tiering inequality, which is roughly the one written here, and various applications of the Harnack inequality for harmonic functions. Um, and for theorem two, uh, one uses, in fact, uh, the Hirschmann, this lemma with uh, a large value of P0, and then one also needs a version of the Lee-Trotter formula and, and very heavy use of Araki Masuda results. Okay, now having gone through some of the technical uh, uh, um, hurdles that one has to face uh, proving this theorem, I, I still think it is a very nice and uh, to me fundamental looking result. It is an improved data processing inequality where you say you um, by when you apply a channel you don't just lose distinguishability of the two states but you can say or give an estimate how much you lose. And um, that implies an approximate recovery when the loss in the data processing inequality is small. Uh, I believe that these 
inequalities can be reviewed as rather non-trivial inequalities for Joyman general for Neumann algebras. And there's a very intimate and in fact improvement of the quantum null energy condition when one applies this set up to inclusion of wedges. And with this, I would like to end my talk. Thank you, Stefan. Very nice talk. So if uh, there are any questions, please ask questions. So uh, I see one question by Jan Mandrisch. Hello, thanks for the nice talk. Um, I just wanted to ask if the beta zero, uh, so the form of the beta zero, this weight function or probability distribution, if it, if it plays a special role or is it, so uh, is it a choice that you make or? Um, yes. Can you still see my screen? Yeah. Okay, maybe I'll go. Yeah, so uh, this kind of expression down here, it um, comes out of this interpolation theorem and it, indirectly it comes out of the theory of harmonic functions on a disk. Uh, so if you have a harmonic function on a disk, then somehow you can uh, express the interior values by the uh, uh, va values on the boundary by Green's theorem. And um, if you map the disk conformally to a, a strip, uh, somehow these Jacobians pop up out. Uh, why they are, uh, and so this is somehow intrinsic to the setup of strips and disks in the complex plane and subharmonic analysis. Okay, Rainer Fertz, do you want to ask anything? Rainer, you raised your hands. Huh? Uh, I think Rainer, your microphone is open, so you can just talk. No, a bit. Uh, it's a mistake. I don't know. Is there anybody who wants to ask questions? Bernard K. Okay, Bernard. A, a very quick and maybe um, stupid question, but um, I was just wondering this term with the cosh, uh, what was it, 2 pi t or something, is it? Uh, has that got some physical interpretation in terms of a temperature or something like that? Um, that's a good question. Oh uh, yeah, so as you know, Bernard, in, in this very general setting, you can normalize the temperature always to one. But in, in a more physical setting, uh, you have an external idea what the temperature is, like in black holes. Case. Mm -hmm. And I believe if you were to normalize the parameters according to this physical temperature, then indeed uh, it would be um, the Hawking temperature would come in in the usual way that you always mm -hmm. have in these Koch factors or Tunch factors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Bernard, uh, Stefan, what about the classical case? Are these inequality new or well known? Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, I, I have um, people here that are big experts in partial differential equations, and it seems uh, at least theorem two is is not uh, totally trivial in even in the classical case. Um, theorem one, I think, depends what you mean by the classical case. So depends what channel you want to consider. So mm -hmm. the typical case is if you have a 
a dissipative semi-group. Uh, so you get a one parameter family of channels. Uh, and then you get certain inequalities, which I think are not uh, known in all cases, even in the classical case. Good. Is there any further question? So maybe I try again. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, now you can hear me, right? Okay. Right. Stefan, right. uh, maybe you can go back to, I think it was the last slide. Conclusions? Um, yeah, uh, or, or one before, I guess. One before. Um, I mean, these, um, these quantities that you're working with, they do they have any relation to these um, entanglement uh, measures that have been investigated for quantum field theory, like uh, by Summers and Werner? Do you see any any relation? Um, okay, so there is a very well known way to build an an, 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 uh, an entanglement measure for any divergence which satisfies the data processing inequality. So uh, you, you you consider the the difference between your given state and the space of separable states, uh, and then depending on what you choose, so S relative entropy is a choice. Uh, you can take uh, the max entropy. There there's a, a big zoo of uh, various divergences and uh, for each one of these you get an entanglement measure now yes. the one by Werner uh, and um, uh, Summers is the Bell measure and uh, I'm not sure whether it can be built this way but I think it's it's nowadays considered while it's very nice and physically intuitive it's it's not a very strong uh, indicator of entanglement I mean, it is an indicator, but you can have, as you know, um, entangled states where you have no violation of Bell, Bell inequality. Yes, yes. And so, so the the motivation by many of these generalized entanglement measures is to improve this this kind of awkward situation. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Good. Any, any more question? If not, uh, we thanks again, Stefano, for this uh, beautiful talk, and uh, we resume in uh, eight, seven, eight minutes with the next speaker, Chris Fuster. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay.